we uh, picked several of our uh, speakers and one non-speaker as uh, potential panelists to answer uh, questions that we thought might come up today out of, out of all of the, uh, the different presentations. And um, I, I guess we can um, sort of start with the first one that, that we had come up with, and that's uh, given, the, given the emerging scientific landscape, are we poised to make a quantum leap progress in rare diseases today? And if so, what's the biggest limiting step? And uh, panel, you'd like to chime in on that? What do you think is limiting? <laughs> Handing it to me. Well, I, don't, I actually don't think there's any particularly one step. I think if, if there's one thing that's going to be hard, it's money. I mean, the really the number of diseases and the costs of doing development, you know, uh, are daunting. So we can say, for example, that we'd like to see natural history studies in all of these diseases. But what inevitably happens is people start figuring out how much that's actually going to cost, and then they don't happen. And so I think that's one of the challenges in it. And I think... There is more interest now among big pharma like Pfizer, Glaxo, or have rare disease programs now. So there's actually more drug development interest than there has been. But I think the question is when that when they come into the business to do something, are they going to how much are they going to get done? And I think that's where the cost factor is. I think one of the predominant ones. Steve, I think one of the big changes that has occurred. Uh, is really the development of an inf infrastructure that we actually have research capacity now to do the studies that years ago we really didn't understand a lot of the aspects of rare disorders, but I think we're in place now uh, to, to be able to launch studies more readily, uh, gain access to patients, um, and, and able to generate some resources funds. And there are translational research programs now that are developing that I think we have access to that just were not in existence several years ago. So, so I think all in all, we're at a point where you're right, we're ready to launch more studies and, and, and more initiatives. Uh, we can always say money is the uh, limiting factor, but I think it's more than that. I think it's, 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 if we're not able to affect the partnerships that are required, uh, the industry, the academic research community, the, the regulatory agencies, and, and the funding uh, agencies, including the NIH and, and the private sector, then we will fail. So, so to me, it's more getting everyone together, becoming focused, and very, very directed at what are, you know, addressing the opportunities that exist, and then moving forward into those products. So, one, one topic which hasn't really been addressed today at all, which uh, is, is a big part of our practice in, in medical genetics and genetic counseling is diagnosis. And, and in Europe, there's a, a number that says that on average, a person with a rare disease goes seven years looking for a diagnosis. And um, I, I would add that even having a diagnosis, a lot of patients go another seven years finding a doctor who knows what to do about it. And, and so I think information is, is one of the big problems. And I think there, um, there are a number of advances that make me really optimistic. So exome sequencing is clearly one of them. And I think that at least for the patients who have monogenic or maybe even oligogenic diseases, the new technologies will enable us to reduce this time from seven years to, you know, go to the doctor, get go to a competent doctor with a good bioinformatician and, you know, get, get a diagnosis. Um, I, I think the, the uh, uh, from what, what my research is, ontology is bioinformatics, um, it, it seems that the molecular genetics com uh, community has really embraced information technology, things like gene ontology, things like databases for sequences, and the medical community is not. So uh, this, this is, is a real barrier to progress because basically people are speaking different languages and, and you know, when gene ontology, which, which is a, basically a lingua franca for genetic functions, so, you know, 15 years ago, the mouse community, the yeast community, and the, uh, uh, the fly community got together and said, look, you guys are calling your genetic functions by completely different names. We're not talking to one another. And they got together, they, they made a common language, and, and now basically, you know, 50 model organisms are, are using this. And 
that basically means that all around the globe, people do not have to write silly computer programs to convert from one thing to the other. And, and this sort of thing is still missing in, in medicine. And um, I think what we need to do is, is to think about ways of making databases, of, of capturing the information that's being published on all of these things to, to help physicians find uh, information that they need and you know anybody who's used a PubMed to try to find you know you, it's it's not it's not easy and a lot of this is just because of the the lack of, of real informatics infrastructure who do you think we should go to to uh, try to close that gap in other words getting the physicians to have a, a bioinformatics person in their office or close by uh, I mean how, how are we gonna how are we gonna do that yeah, I mean, that's, there's no one thing that's going to do that. I, th I think um, the, the movement towards electronic patient records is really important just because, um, you know, clearly uh, it, it, it's, it's easy to, to think of little windows opening up and saying, look, are you sure you want to prescribe 100 milligrams of this because your patient has a SNP in this pharmacogenetic gene? I mean, I think things like that are, are going to come, and as soon as people realize that you can really save lives, you know, and probably not just for people with rare diseases, um, but I, th I think the whole field is going to move towards, towards personalized medicine, and we'll realize, I, my guess here, speculation that a lot of common diseases are, are really collections of lots and lots of rare diseases, and I, I think that's going to be one thing which might help the rare disease community. Um, I, I think I, in genetics, you know, I, there's al we've always been a little bit ahead of the game in, in terms of computers and standardization, and, uh, you know, you sort of see now people are starting to accept standards for naming mutations. Yeah. Slowly. Some of the slides today were wrong, by the way, so shame on you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're, we're working on something called the Human Phenotype Ontology, which is... Yes. Hopefully, it's, it's becoming actually used by a number of groups as a standard way of describing uh, phenotypic manifestations. Uh, Segalen, I may, and many others, I think that's been mentioned by one of the speakers today, are developing a, an ontology of rare diseases, which basically will bring rare diseases I into ICD-11. And um, I think the states are still in ICD-9, so who knows when this will be. Be done here, but the, essentially ma by making this visible for hospital statistics that will give rare diseases a name and people, you know, if it really is true that 8% of people have a rare disease and, you know, people say this, this and, you know, we're making money on them, there, there are patients in the hospital, uh, then I think just this alone will, will make a, a, a very big difference. So with the, uh, with the human ontology that you're talking about, the phenotype ontology, who, who is your receptive audience at this point? Physicians, scientists? Who, who do you talk to with that? Um, we, well, actually, we started this as a, as a research project, and, and um, soon, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, found there was an enormous interest for, for having this as a, as a tool. And so um, this has been now adopted by a number of consortia. So the, the ISCA consortium of David Ledbetter, which is gathering uh, array CGH data, the Decipher community, Orphanet, uh, the, the Dutch uh, clinical system is talking with us. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, ontologies are like telephone networks. As soon as you have data that's been annotated, the more data you have, the easier it is to, I mean, the, the more other data is worth because you can compare it with, with many things. and. So certainly what, what we're trying to do now is to open this up to collaborative development. So a number of groups are now working with us to improve, you know, for instance, I know nothing about dental medicine and, so, and mm. next week somebody's coming to, to actually improve that part of the HPO and, so, and that's, that, that's our audience right now. So it's, it's sort of academic uh, MDs and, and researchers. So, so does ORDR use uh, a, a lot of this? Um, actually, we, we initiated discussion following up on this at a meeting recently in, in Iceland between the European Union and the United States in a, in a uh, discussion of, of all the multiple programs that we need to become more coordinated, more systematic. So we, we were discussing this possibility, and uh, I think it's something we're going to see in the future even more as, as, as we begin to work together 
and other parts of the world really come together and focus around the rare disorders. And uh, already we have a tremendous interest in, in other parts of the world uh, to join the efforts that, that we initiated in Iceland. We'll continue with another meeting in, uh, in April 6th, 7th, and 8th in Washington, and then we'll, we'll go from there. We'll draw up some agreements. We hope to draw up some agreements of, of collaboration and how we're going to foster research with rare disorders. I, th I think you're going to see some very good things coming out of this moving into the future. Anybody else? Oh. From the um, family's point of view, I can safely say that I think that we were very lucky to get diagnosed early on with, with Rocket. He was, he was only a couple of months old. And uh, I believe it was because um, HUD had actually gone to Children's Hospital in, in L.A. shortly before that to give a talk to the, the staff that was there. And the doctors um, who saw Rocket then pretty quickly uh, knew what he had, even before they told us uh, that they knew. And I think that if we had been someplace else, uh, we might never have known what he had. I think there, I'm sure that there are many families who have children who don't thrive and who have uh, different uh, types of pathologies and they never know, you know, why their child uh, died or why they had such, uh, you know, multiple things going on with them. So from the family's point of view, it is very important that medical doctors get information. I know that uh, Mia and Taylor took him to you know, of course, many, many different doctors because every part of his body was affected, and most of them had never heard of CDG. And uh, so the parents were educating the doctors, and, uh, and I know you, you've experienced this as well. And this is, you know, I think this would be most helpful, and then by giving the, the doctors the information, the parents get the information, it empowers the parents, and guess what parents do? I mean, I've met several people here, parents, grandparents, and the community. Then you get, um, then you get some real forces going to support um, the great work that you all are doing. Family power. <clears throat> Actually, one of the things I'm excited about uh, that uh, came out of the Rare Disease Office is the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And it's only a pilot, I guess, at NIH. But the concept to have places around the country where people can go for a diagnosis when, you know, their physicians are drawing a blank. They have a resource where there's a dedicated group who are just looking for the zebras. And uh, I think moving that out to regional centers across the country would be hugely important to families so they could get a diagnosis, and we'll find more people with rare diseases. It's only Dr. House on TV and Bill Gall at the NIH at the moment, so uh, go, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I, like so many of our other programs that we've been able to initiate, including a genetic test development program and, and others, we, we use our clinical center as a, as a test bed for, for new programs, and this is certainly one that has gained quite a bit of interest and, uh, of course, there's always a question of resources. I think there at NIH we have the luxury of, of conducting a lot of tests and, and doing a lot of studies that uh, perhaps always aren't uh, uh, costed out appropriately, you know, that we just, they're just cost of operations. And, and so the expenses that we incur with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program are a lot less than what we might find out in the community where every test has to be accounted for or paid for by someone. Uh, and, and at the NIH, they're just part of the daily operations. And, and so even with the budget, we find that the interest is just so tremendous and, and, and uh, overwhelming that, as Janine mentioned, there's a tremendous need out there in the community for, for more programs like this that would facilitate getting that diagnosis for the people. So we'll see how the budget years go if we're still in operation. Like a budget week. <laughs> yeah, I think about it. March 3rd or, 3rd or 4th, yeah, we're all holding on. <laughs> Well, so in this uh, time of lean budgets, how, uh, how do we prioritize the, the use of these resources? What's the, what's the right way to go about this? Now everybody's jumping in the microphone, aren't they? Yeah. 
I'll start and have everybody continue and everyone continue. <laughs> no. uh, you know, it, identifying priorities is always difficult because everyone wants their disease st studied and investigated. We always want, everyone wants their, their disorder uh, treated. Uh, and I think the realities are such that, that many of the diseases just are not ready for product development. We just don't have the basic understanding of the disease. We don't have potential compounds. So it's almost uh, a situation that we have to start taking advantage of what is ready for product development and begin to look at those and then to foster the relationships uh, that are required to, to move potential products forward. It, it, it is a difficult decision because there, there is not an endless supply of money that we can address all the disorders. So it is. it becomes somewhat of a competition to see who is most ready for development and then start, uh, show that the model works, and then hopefully you'll gain more partners and more interest in developing other compounds for other rare disorders by by having successes er early on. So in some respects, you know, people will often try to get to the low-hanging fruits and, and, and gain these successes and then try to interest others and also uh, supporting the research or the development of products. So it, it, it is a tough decision, but it, but it's which compounds are ready, which ones are, are do we have uh, clinical trials all set to go, um, and we just need a little bit of funding, or we need to fund a few small studies to get over the over that bridge uh, that will enable the, the more clinical research uh, trials to actually get started. So we have to look at the opportunities. I think one, one other way to think about this is not expecting the government to actually fund the development work. And part of what we've been doing in our campaign is try to show how simply changing a few policies, which wouldn't cost the government that much money, would charge up the amount of investment <coughs> coming in. It would be far greater than the NIH budget. They would actually do a lot more and get people with expertise in drug development applying their skills to the to the cause. And, and then prioritization they will do anyways because they're going to look at the low-hanging fruit, the ones that are closer to the clinic and pick those up and run with them. And the ones that affect more patients will be necessarily um, addressed more earlier than, than the most rare ones. So I think the natural process of evaluating opportunities and executing will happen. And I think if the FDA this year and Congress has the opportunity to change policy in response to the Brownback-Brown Amendment, and just that alone would send a signal to industry that uh, we really want you to work on these rare diseases, and uh, I think that would could dramatically increase the amount of investment without spending any of the government money. that further and develop that further, response to that is that's yeah, that, that is sure. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely correct, and I, and I hear the same things. I mean, I, I've heard the same things about the natural history studies, you know, not being significant, what Janine mentioned ab about her grant application. So we, we do hear about this, and, and, I, and I think that's part of the reason where we, we are now proposing a number of translational research uh, programs, in including the, what I mentioned, the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases program, the, the Cures Acceleration Network that was uh, mentioned in uh, uh, last year's uh, uh, 
uh, uh, budget, or, or this year's budget, I'm sorry, and of course since we don't have the budget, we're not sure exactly where we're going with this, but it does provide the opportunity, along with several others that exist within the, the institutes, uh, the Cancer Institute that I mentioned, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has a number of number initiatives, the uh, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act. So I think it's really becoming familiar with what resources are available and how we tap into those to make sure that these products that are coming out of the screening program actually do not just lay around and that we, we move them forward. Uh, and I think there are programs now available and, and the, the number of public-private partnerships are increasing. And so it's a tremendous change for the scientific community, I think, to get used to the idea that we're now thinking of, of developing products as opposed to doing basic research. And, and the idea is that you know, we're not reducing the amount of basic research, we're adding on to, to the, the traditional research uh, portfolio that everyone is used to, to facilitate the development of treatments. This is what uh, the public is asking, this is what members of Congress, uh, they are asking the NIH to do, and I think we're, we're trying to be responsive to the needs and so it, it is a critical point, and uh, I think in the near future you're going to see a, a, this expansion, and as information comes out about the programs that are available, you'll see that there are compounds that will be tested and moving forward. So it, it's uh, really paying attention to what the resources are available, contacting the program people and staying in close touch with them uh, and, and offering your, your compounds for further treatment. And at some point, maybe we'll come up with some more RO1s to do clinical trials. One thing I would suggest is um, the Cure Acceleration Network might be the kind of grants that would be separate and designed for the purpose, but it didn't get funded because we went to continuing resolution, so who knows what's going to happen to that. But the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation Research Grant Program, primarily designed to fund grants to businesses but the question I would ask is why shouldn't the scope be opened up for what I would call pre-business? That is, the, the work just before you form the company, right? Where you're trying to put the work together that says, hey, I have enough something to, to have a business. And if, if SBR program is really designed to deal with those kind of programs, and um, the dilemma I always had when I was a professor was, well, then I have to kind of pretend to form a company in order to be able to file that and then or get a partner, but with the rules, the for-profit company has to get most of the money and you only get a certain amount as a contractor. And there's a lot of games going on, but that program, because it gets a fixed fraction of the NIH uh, budget, ends up having a lower pay line and potentially larger awards and therefore um, I think by expanding the scope to activities which are clearly designed toward therapeutic development, therefore are intrinsically business focused as opposed to basic research, you know, um, might make sense as a, a tweak that would actually dramatically change things. You're forming a, a company to become the entity? <laughs> I, I just uh, have one last question here then. So if we accept this uh, idea that everybody working together is, is a, a good idea and it's, it's physician plus scientist plus uh, family advocates, you know, give you uh, the optimal growth, physicians are clearly there because of the nature of their job. Families are there not always by choice, but they're there. How do we attract more scientists? Uh, to rare disease research, 
besides having enormous grants, because that'll always work, um, and in translational related work, how do, is, do you see a mechanism? And is, is part of that mechanism just us getting out there, maybe the way Janine was talking about it, uh, there gets to be a groundswell, and then people say, oh, yeah, you know, I read about that on Facebook. I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you have some ideas? I, I think one of the things you have to do is, is get sort of a Howard Hughes-like program, but for junior people coming out of fellowship, really top-tier postdocs, to be able to get five, seven-year funding that they wouldn't have to kill themselves first year, especially if they're MD, PhD, and they have some clinical responses, some other things where they just die with the clinical responsibilities and trying to get grants at the same time, and you end up burning up those people that really should be doing that kind of work. And I was struggling for five years myself, so I know, and that's why, you know, I ultimately left and went to I went to a company because I was going to get millions of dollars. I didn't have to write grants, and I got to do what I wanted to do. So it was basically um, no brainer. So the challenge is that there's a lot, not as many junior positions that are protected well enough to be able to get them to go. So if you had those kind of positions available that were fully funded, that were highly desirable, that you recruit top people, then who say that's a pretty nice setup. If I work on a rare disease area, then I can get five years of funding, you know, uh, be able to get a, sta a certain number of staff, and then it allows those people that it may be translational, MD, PhD types, to be able to actually make it work as assistant professors instead of, you know, dying on the vine and end up giving up. Yeah, that is definitely one of the major concerns of, of the leadership of NIH anyway as far as uh, providing support for the new investigators. I think now the the average age is somewhere around 42 or 43 years old until they get their first R01 independent <laughs> grant. And that's getting up there in age. Uh, and that's that's a long time after graduate school or, or medical school and uh, uh, further fellowship. So I, I think people are really aware of it, but but trying to gain that solution that it really has an impact and, and you know, significant numbers. Um, I know there are several programs that are available uh, that, that are attempting to do this, but the numbers are still small. Uh, but again, if, if you can get a few started and you have some successes, perhaps the other institutes and everyone else will contribute and have more buy-in. Um, and I, I think one of the things I would add, uh, what, what I've heard from people over the years is uh, many of the basic scientists, when they get to meet the families and, and the patients, that's when they, they have probably the, the greatest impact uh, on their, their commitment or the recommitment to research when they start to see that what they're doing really will have a, an effect, a positive effect on, on patients and, and the families and, and uh, what high esteem they're held by, by the patients and families. And this, this really drives, I think, a lot of the research. Uh, but it, it's, it's, again, making that association and not being fearful that by meeting patients or the families that they are really going to put that extreme pressure to find treatments. Uh, the patients and the families, they have a high level of, of information and knowledge about the rare disease, and they understand that you can't just go from this day to until tomorrow and have a treatment, that it is going to take time, And uh, but it really helps having them in your corner to go forth and be your advocates, both in the government and outside in the public. I think... Um, one thing that's become obvious um, also from the, the talks today is, is that, first of all, diagnostics is getting to be much more complex. We're looking at the exome and not just one gene, but also, also the, the therapeutic options are going to depend on what kind of mutation you have and probably will depend on what your proteome is looking like, and maybe it's many other things. And if you actually look into a normal clinic, so I'm, I'm actually at the biggest hospital in, in Germany, very academic, and none of my colleagues have, have, are able to deal with this kind of information. And I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but medi medical MPs do not have training in statistics and math and computer science. And, I mean, they don't have to program, but I, I think we need to bring MDs a, li a little bit more into the realm of molecular medicine and I think we also need to train bioinformaticians to think a little bit more medically, because I think that's going to become a very important profession in the hospital in the next 10 years.
Well, <laughs> you're not being very encouraging, Fred. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I take your point. We're actually starting a, a program for sort of what here would be MD-PhDs that's going to go a little bit in this direction. So we'll see how well that goes, but, yeah. Well, it's been a long day. And uh, I hope everybody feels it's been a productive one. And uh, I've sure seen some exciting things, and I hope you have too. And I hope all the people in the lab are inspired by what they see uh, going on. And uh, I really want to thank all the all the speakers, and uh, especially our panelists over here, and uh, the families families that came, and the benefit that I hope that they got out of it. So uh, with that, I think it's probably time we uh, uh, close the meeting and get out in the lobby and have a couple of drinks. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming.